Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and today I am so excited to be here with Paige Allen. Paige is the Executive Pastor of Missions and Team Development at Church on the Rock in Lubbock, Texas. She's also author of the book, He Knows Your Name, How Seven Nameless Women of the Bible Reveal Christ's Love for You. God, we just ask that you would um, just be with us today and just allow us to completely surrender to you, um, that you would help us to um, just see you for who you are, um, that, that you would help us to know that we are seen um, and that if there is anything in us, anything outside of us that is preventing us from a full and complete relationship with you, Father, that you would just break those barriers down, just dissolve those walls and allow us to come to see you face to face today. Amen. Amen. All right, Paige, thank you for being here. We really just appreciate you um, coming to talk about this really important book. Well, thank you for having me, Jamie. I'm excited about our conversation today. Um, well, I, I just want to, I guess we start off, I want to dive right in, but we like to ask all of our guests what your favorite prayer closet is. So, you know, that in air quotes, where do you like to meet with God? I love that question. I, I like to meet with God on walks outside is my primary place. I also have a chair in my house, like a specific chair where, um, I love to meet him in the mornings with a good cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have found recently a lot of our, um, more lively conversations <laughs> and, um, where I've just really, you know, been able to just pour my heart out to him. It's taken place while I'm on a walk in my neighborhood. I think there's something about even moving our bodies, like as we're talking, um, it's, it's become one of my favorite things and favorite ways to connect with him. I agree. And I think for myself, I think I've sort of realized that it's, um, moving does something to untangle my thoughts because I'm doing something physical. And I think my brain is like busy walking or looking around. And it's kind of like, there's this background, like white noise of activity in my brain that keeps it busy enough that my thoughts don't feel like they're overwhelming. Like when I'm in silence and I close my eyes, which I do sometimes to pray. Um, but when I do that, it's a little more difficult to focus. So there's just, I don't know what the science is behind that, but I, I definitely feel like there's so much benefit plus just blood flow to the brain, right? It just helps you to like, yeah, you know, absolutely. I do think there is science. I don't know what it is, but I, I don't I either like I read an article about that one time. Yes. <laughs> we'll investigate. We'll come back and do another episode on the yeah. science of walking and praying because yes. yeah, there's something there. Mm -hmm. Um, well, what, I want to know what inspired you to write, he knows your name, which is, I mean, obviously about being seen nameless women being seen, like what, how, how did that come about? Yeah. Well, you, you did a great job of sharing my bio earlier. I've worked at a church for like 20 years now, um, which in today's world, that's a really long time. It is. And so over the years, I've just met so many amazing men and women, both, but specifically women who I have the privilege of, of working with. And I kept feeling like there was this common theme in conversations I would have, regardless of the age or stage of life, th these questions of just, do I have value? Do I have worth? Does anybody see what I'm doing? What is my purpose? And and it didn't matter, you know, if it was a college girl, she was wondering, it, it, would, it would be formed more in the package of, does, is there a guy out there that's ever going to take notice of me? But it, but it was really like a symptom of this deeper question internally. And then moms with little ones saying, I don't think anyone has any idea what I'm actually doing all day long, you know, in the midst of goldfish crumbs. And, and then um, even women that are empty nesters, just all of a sudden feeling like, this, you know, I poured my life into my children and now they're gone and I'm, I'm kind of feeling unmoored. And so I had that in the back of my mind that there was this common thread and theme of women just needing to know that they were seen by God. And then simultaneously, I was teaching a Bible study at one point and a lady came up to me afterwards and she made a comment that she had been studying um, a woman in the Old Testament. And she said, you know, there's just something about the nameless women of the Bible that I'm drawn to. And she said that phrase, nameless women. 
And it just lodged in my heart and in my mind. And I realized I had never labeled the stories that I was drawn to as the nameless one of the Bible. But I, I, I think later I was talking to the Lord or having some time in prayer and opening the word. And I realized, oh, wait, like, I, I like the nameless woman of the Bible too. Like I realized like a lot of my teachings and I, I was talking about these women that we just knew by their issue or their label. And, um, so I kind of just decided to do a deep dive with the Lord of like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go study specifically the nameless woman of the Bible and those, that need connected with those stories. And I just realized, I think maybe I have a book on my hands. That's great. And as I, I told you earlier, I listened to your book as an audio book and I would recommend anyone do that because it's so nice to hear your voice. Like I, I feel like I know you already, but just to hear these stories, to hear this insight that you've gotten from the Bible um, in your own words and in your own voice is really powerful. But um, as I listened, I, I found the same thing where I just thought, I, I don't think I had thought of them as nameless necessarily, some of them. But there were some that I was just like, yeah, these are some of my some of the most powerful stories that I resonate with in the Bible. And and so I just am so glad that you wrote this book. And um, it's not just about Bible stories, though. You bring in so much just relevant personal information and experiences that make the concepts very tangible and very um, just illustrate them beautifully. So. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> well, well, that's how I think. I yeah. think in stories and, and I wanted the ladies, I, I feel like sometimes there can be a disconnect. We read about biblical stories and we think, you know, I don't have an issue of blood. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe I do have a physical issue, but I'm going to the doctor. And so just trying to say, okay, but here's the principles and let me show you how that works out practically and how it's worked out in my life. Yeah, that was really good. Um, I think my favorite story, just as a as a fellow parent, one of my favorite stories that you shared is about your daughter's prayer to be a flower girl um, and just how that outcome came to pass and the prayer journey that went that you went on and like kind of the unexpected process. Could you just share that? Are you willing to share that story with Absolutely. us? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, I love this story too. So my daughter, who is almost 14, when she was four, um, one night I was tucking her into bed and she just out of the blue said, mom, I need to tell you about my greatest dream. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, that's a big deal. And she said, my greatest dream is to be a flower girl. And I, you know, I kind of talked to her about it for a second. And, um, and she said, when am I going to be a flower girl? And I tried, you know, as, as most women do, moms will do like, I, I was like, well, here's the deal, honey. Not everyone gets to be a flower girl. Uh, usually you become a flower girl if someone you're really close to gets married. And, um, and she quickly made me, you know, made me aware of that her cousins had all been flower girls, which was correct. And, and so I was explaining, well, that's because they had an uncle who got married. So I'm trying to explain it to her that it just doesn't work out for everyone. When, when she looked at me and she said, well, what about you, mom? Were you a flower girl? And, oh, I wanted to like stand in solidarity and say, no, I wasn't, but I was a flower girl. And so I said, yeah, honey, I was. And she goes, well, then I want to be a flower girl. And without even, I, it was just subconscious. I didn't even think about it. What slipped out of my mouth was, well, why don't you just pray about it? And, and then you as, immediately go. I did. <laughs> I wanted to take those words back because I thought oh, she's four. I think I'm setting her up for disappointment in God mm -hmm. because in my own mind, immediately I'm running through, this is how we are, right? Every person I know <laughs> that's marriageable age. And I'm like, I don't know anyone that's going to ask her to be a flower girl. But as I'm thinking these thoughts, she literally, she closes her eyes and she, you know, folds her hands and she just prays the sweetest prayer and just says, Jesus, please make me a flower girl. It is my greatest dream. And I think she says something along the lines like, I promise I will be so pretty and I will flow, I will throw those petals <laughs> and, uh, in Jesus name, amen. And so I tucked her in and I, I go, I talk to my husband and I literally, I'm like, ah. I think I just blew it. You know, I, I just told her to pray about being a flower girl. Well, wouldn't you know that really just, I think it maybe it was like two weeks later, 
I got a phone call. And at this time, my husband and I, we were college pastors and a young woman in our college group asked if she could come meet with me. And I had met with her kind of like, you know, counseling discipleship kind of thing once or twice, but I did not know her well. And so I figured that's what she was coming to meet about. She came to my office, sat down and she said, well, this is a little bit strange, but two weeks ago I had a dream and it was my wedding, which she was engaged. And she said, and your daughter, Selah was my flower girl. And she said, I just couldn't shake it. And so I talked to Sam, that was her fiance. And he said, well, that's great. She said, we weren't going to have flower girls. And, but he said, yeah, I, cause I can't shake it. So she said, I know this is so strange. I don't even know your daughter, but do you think she'd want to be our flower girl? Jamie, I'm sure you can imagine. I was just floored. And, mm-hmm. and I think I, I think I teared up and I just thought the goodness of God, like listening to this four-year-old little girl's prayer that this was like her greatest dream. Like that is the kind of God that he is, you know? And so what I loved too was I took her down, right. Um, to, to, she asked Sayla personally and Sayla without missing a beat was just like, yeah, sure. Of course. Like, you know, it just, it just made me see the difference in the way yes. I pray sometimes, you know, it wasn't my a best. surprise to her that God answered. That's like, sure. And And here we are, the seasoned prayer warriors, like, wow, that's incredible. God actually answered that prayer. Like, we didn't think he would do that. (laughs) It's so true. Like, why, why do I have so, such little faith that I was, you know, moved by that? But I, yeah. And she was like, of course I prayed. I knew it was going to happen. So, um, so yeah, so she, she got to be, she got to be the flower girl. So um, I, I do share in the book though. Do you want me to share about the rest of the story? Yes, because I think the rest of the story is like the first part. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I love it. But I loved even more the second part because you could have so easily just been like, you know, let's tie this up with a bow, but, um, and, and have this and do what we want to do for our kids with the rest of the world that reads this book and, and portray God as, oh yeah, he answered this crazy prayer with a crazy way. Someone had a dream. I mean, it's not that God always works that way. So that's an exciting story. And you could have left it at that, but you went on and you were so real and I just loved it. So yeah, tell the rest of the story and and kind of the parallels that you drew from that in your own life. So, um, yeah, you're right. And I'm, let me say this. It's so tempting for all of us sometimes to put those pretty red bows Mm -hmm. on half of the story, the end happily ever after. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll do that for you too. You know? Um, but so the day of the wedding, um, it just so happened that that was the exact same day of her dance recital, which was, that was the only, you know, extra thing she was doing. And so she's four years old. I make a plan. Okay. The dance recital is in the morning. Then we had to drive an hour to the wedding. And so, you know, I'm like timing it. I'm like, okay, it's okay. She's going to take a nap on the drive and we'll get to the wedding. Everything will be fine. But of course, as moms with young kids know, she didn't take a nap. The devil you know. kept her awake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, so when we pull up to the, the wedding, she was tired. You know, she needed a nap. She, her, her adrenaline was crashing. And uh, so we go and we get ready. We go into this room with the bride and the bridesmaids. And she has this really beautiful little lace dress. And then they had made this gorgeous, um, flower crown that they put on her and it matched the bride. And so they were going to take pictures before the wedding. So she's still good for about 30 minutes. It's all new, fun, exciting. And then we go outside to take pictures and the photographer is lining everyone up. She is in the center, in the middle of the picture, you know, in front of the bride and the bridesmaids. And she's just standing there, like not a smile to be had, just looking off kind of stoic. And the photographer's like, uh, Sayla, Sayla, come on, give, give us a smile, you know? And, and she's like, no. So I, you know, I kind of hold up my finger and say, give it, just give us a second. You know, I pull her to the side. And first of all, I, I do all my mom tricks, right? So I started with bribery, let her know, Hey, there's cake. <laughs> Listen, just, I know, I know you're tired, babe, but you've got to smile. This is what we do. You know, this is part of the wedding and that did not work. And so then I tried like, you know, getting really serious and listen, like, you have got to go smile. Like you agreed to be a flower girl. This is a part of the flower girl. And she just kept saying, you know, this flower crown is so itchy and the pictures are so boring. I I don't want to do it. And when I tried to get, you know, a little stern with her, 
all of a sudden the meltdown happened and she began to cry her lip began to quiver and then it just full on uh came out and so I looked over at the photographer and was like okay we're gonna we're gonna need a few more minutes and I scooped her up and I walked away and I actually ended up literally where the ceremony was going to be. So, you know, it's, it was an outdoor ceremony. So there's, you know, chairs and stuff. And there was like a, a really pretty, I think it was like a cross with a, some flowers and some things. And so I take her over there. I let her cry and I'm praying, you know, at this time, just like, Lord, okay, well, you've got to help me here. <laughs> I don't want to ruin these, these people's wedding, you know, and I, I want more for her. And Um, but mostly it was just a frazzled mom prayer, like help me out, help me. And I felt like in that moment that I heard the Lord say, and when I say that, I just think I had this thought come through my mind, um, that I, I knew was not my own. And it was the thought of remind her of who she is. And so I let her finish crying. And then I said, say, let's look around and look at how pretty this is. And so we're, we're literally, I have her tell me, what do you see? And so she's pointing out things that are really cool. And I'm pointing out things that I see. And then I said, and Sayla, look at how pretty you are. Like, look at how pretty, did you realize your dress matches the bride's dress? And, and look at this crown. I'm, I'm holding it at this point. Um, or it's on the ground and I'm like, look at how pretty it is it matches the bride. No one else matches the bride, but you. And, and I said, because who are you? And she kind of looked at me strange and, and then she kind of said, I'm the flower girl. And I said, that's right. Sayla, you are the flower girl. I said, so let's say it again. Who are you? And she said, well, I'm the flower girl. And I, and I kind of began to just say, Sayla, I want to remind you, like, this is your greatest dream ever. You are the flower girl. And here's what I want you to see. I was like, you see that owl right there? In a few minutes, you get to walk down the aisle and you get to throw the petals and everybody's going to be looking at you and talking about how pretty you are. But right now, part of being the flower girl is going over and taking those pictures. Part of being the flower girl is wearing this itchy flower crown. But listen, if we do that part, the best part is coming, you know? And I think we said it a couple more times. I'm the flower girl. I'm the flower girl. And something shifted inside of her, Jamie, as she began to say it, it was like, she really remembered, oh, this is who I am. And before I knew it, she literally, she took that flower crown, she put it on her head. And she, I remember, because I journaled about this next day, she said, let's do this thing. And she walked over and she smiled for the pictures. And so she's over there and I'm just kind of staying to the side watching. And I really felt like the Lord said, you were just like that. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And he said, yeah, you are just like that. And, and I feel like he just said, you know what? There have been things that you have prayed for, that you have asked for, things that are your dream. And then you begin to live it out. And instead of focusing on the amazing parts and even who you are, instead you get so distracted with your version of itchy flower crowns and boring pictures. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you even either give up or throw tantrums, or you discount what I'm doing because you're more focused on the aspects that do sometimes come with, with the dreams in your heart that I am bringing forth in your life. And, um, and it was just such a lesson to me of like, I almost every day have a choice. Am I going to focus on the itchy flower crowns and the boring pictures of my life? Or am I going to focus on who I am and who God has called me to be? And so that's my flower girl story. <laughs> I love it. And I, I just think it is so, uh, I wasn't sure where you were going with the story at first. I'm like, is she going to get the flower girl thing? Cause you know, if she hadn't gotten the flower girl thing, it could have been a lesson in God gives us what we need, not always what we want. Mm-hmm. She gets it. But then there's this other, I've just never heard anyone really talk about when we get the answer to what we're praying for, that there's still messy middle, there's still difficult stuff, and that absolutely we forget and lose sight of what God has done when we get into those tough spots and the itchy flower crowns. And oh, I just love it. So thank you for that reminder of, I think it does boil down to who are you and whose are you? And and I think if we remember that, I mean, I just, it helped me 
to look at some things in my life that had been have been answers to prayer that I find difficulty in or I find a strain or whatever and and just to be able to flip that script really um quickly because I think it's it's spiritual warfare really it's it's basically praying against the lies whether they're self-inflicted lies from our sinful nature whether it's lies straight from the enemy and his minions and the spiritual realm shooting fiery darts at our spirits we don't know but it's lies that keep us from abundance right where we are and and recognizing and remembering who god is so anyway just love it that was a great story thanks <laughs> well another thing that you share just a personal personal things that you share um is just a time that you and your husband were facing a difficult situation and it just involved you guys um and especially him just feeling hopeless and even getting a little cynical and, and, you know, you, uh, his praying even kind of went along those lines at first. Could you, um, could you share that story and just kind of how that ended for him? Yeah, I will. I actually, um, he shared it just last night in a small group that we are leading right now. And, um, I, so it's, it's fresh in my brain. So when we were in our, in our twenties, um, he he started a business and the way the business worked um he got paid every quarter based on if he made it was it was investments so if he made people money then he got a small percentage of that and um they actually started the business the week before September 11th and so um the way the stock market works it was it was bad it started it started really bad and so literally he had not gotten paid for about a year and a half because they were just you know pulling themselves out of this hole. Well, finally they were getting out of that hole, had broken even, and were starting to make, you know, um, some positive gains. And he, I, I didn't know this, but he said this last night, he said, he said, I'll never forget. It was March 30th. It was the last day of the quarter. And he was just watching and they were positive. And then some things happened with the stock market and th that quarter ended with break even. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't bad for their investors, but it was bad for him <laughs> because it meant he would not even have the chance to get paid for another three months. And he was so upset. You know, not only had he already been going through this journey and this wilderness and this heartache for a year and a half, but he had started to get his hopes up. And all of a sudden, within one day, they were just dashed again. And he said he was sitting there. He was in our house. He worked out of our house. He was there alone. And he picked up the phone to actually call his mom. Now, he called his mom because I am I am not the most compassionate person. She is incredibly compassionate. So he actually made the right decision to call his mom rather than me. And uh, so he, he picks up the phone and he's, he's telling his mom what happened. And he was prepared for her just to, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, honey. I love, you know, I don't know, pat him on the head, basically. And instead, she says, well, Josh... I think you need to hang up the phone and thank God for your losses. And he was kind of like, I'm sorry, mom, what? And she, she actually hung up the phone on him. She <laughs> said, you heard me. You need to, you need to go thank God for your losses right now. Hmm. And uh, so he hung up the phone and he, he was a little bit stunned for a few minutes. And then finally he got, he, yeah, he got very cynical and sarcastic. And he said, you want me to thank God for my losses? Okay okay, God, I'm going to thank you for my losses. And he said, he just, he just kind of laid into the Lord. <laughs> like, you know what, God? Okay, sure. God, thank you that I haven't made it a penny for a year and a half. God, thank you that now I get to wait another three months. God, thank you that, um, my wife has had to carry the full burden of financial responsibility for the last year and a half. God, thank you. And he said he just, you know, he just basically, he was able to just get it all out to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And something shifted as he was praying and talking because he said once he had kind of come to the end of all of the frustrations he was thanking him for, without even realizing it, what came out of his mouth was, but God, thank you that somehow we've been able to pay all of our bills. God, thank you that somehow, you know, um, I've still, I still sense that you're here with me. God, thank you that somehow my wife, although she's a little fresh, she's still supportive. God, thank you. And, and he said, it just, it's, it's become a mark, a marker in his life. 
And what started as cynical and sarcastic, it turned into a moment of just breaking with him and and in a really beautiful way of him realizing God is with me. And as hard as this place is, he's with me here in this. And as hard as this place is, somehow he it can only be God that things are not they couldn't they're not worse, basically. And so yeah, it it was it was a defining moment and and it for our life um and for our family's life, it's become a thing of, you know, even when things are hard, we will be a family that chooses gratitude and chooses to thank God even for our losses because he's he's still with us and he's there. So, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I just feel like that is such an important reminder of, I think, I, I don't know. Do you think that he would have gotten to that point of true Thanksgiving without getting the frustration out with God? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, you know, I think it had built up to a place of, it almost goes back to what we were talking about, putting the pr- pretty red bows on it. He's a, mm-hmm. He's an incredibly like optimistic person. And so for the average person, they had no idea what we were going through. You know, mm-hmm. he didn't, he was, we're good. We're fine. Yeah. It's a challenge, but you know, we're, you know, and, um, and it was forcing himself to just actually name what was so hard in that moment that I think it, it almost broke through the ice between him and God. I don't think he would have said it that way, but his relationship with the Lord had gotten uh, pretty superficial because there was so much underneath there Mm -hmm. of disappointment and anger, and he just needed to get it out, you know? And I think a lot of us are like that. Um, I think sometimes we are way too polite in our prayers, Mm -hmm. but we're not going to offend God. He wants wants our hearts and he wants our honesty. And it's not until we can get honest that I think we can really even hear him in, in such a real way. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. I just, I feel like that whole story is just an invitation to engage with God because once, you know, I think isolation is where the enemy can work and where we can, you know, cut ourselves off from God's power, his transforming power. But even if you're ranting or being sarcastic or any number of of things that might feel sacrilegious at the time as a like quote good christian girl you know i think anytime we're cut off like we're we're blocking god's work he's always there and always willing but even when but if we open up with that anger with that frustration cynicism whatever like that is evidenced in in your husband that um that it opens the door for the holy spirit to transform us as we pray as we rage and it doesn't mean that it's going to happen necessarily in that prayer like it did with your husband but i just feel like someone out there needs to know get it out god can take it you don't have to he knows what's in your heart and you and and it is an absolute lie Mm -hmm. that you need to keep it bottled up or put on a mask or, or, you know, smile when you're feeling, um, devastated in, at least in prayer with God. I mean, obviously there's a time to push through and whatever, but when you're with God, let it out, (laughs) let it out. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think, I mean, that's what we see David doing in so many of the Psalms, like what a beautiful, like example in scripture of he just, he let all kinds of things out, you know, but, um, I think that's also kind of what keeps our heart so soft and connected to the Lord. You know, I think it's when we try to almost protect our hearts or protect our images with the Lord, where we begin to have distance with him. So, yeah. And so many of those Psalms, you'll see them. I mean, it's just like, kind of like your husband's prayer, really. It plays out the same way. It's a progression of rage, how, why, and then, oh, but but God, I love you. And God, you're my refuge. And where else am I going to go? You know? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in this book, um, actually, I want to know what was, do you have a favorite of these women? Do you have a favorite one 
that you oh, it, covered? That's a great question. I I don't. They have they have changed. I have <laughs> just like uh, it just like kids, you know. It just kind of <laughs> yes, yes. I like them all. I really do. I I don't have a favorite. Um, it, it depends on the day. Yeah. Well, and that's the, these lessons are so applicable at different times. I can imagine that you kind of still draw from them as you're going through different times. Yes. Yeah. Well, in, in your book, you talk about some barriers to prayer and like kind of how Satan sometimes attempts to keep us from prayer. What are some of those that come to mind and, you know, what are some of the lies that can come at us? Yeah. You know, I, I definitely think that the enemy does not want us praying at all. He doesn't want us to connect with the Lord. So I think there are so many, there are so many different tactics of the enemy. I think sometimes um, it's shame. He loves to just whisper lies of shame and that, um, you know, who do you think you are, you know, to go talk to the Lord. Sometimes I think, you know, he just makes us feel guilty um, makes us compare with other people or other women, or, you know, you can even hear a podcast like this or, and hear someone talk about how long they pray for. And he'll just whisper like, well, you aren't really a prayer person, you know, right. um, you know, two days ago, you fell asleep while you were trying to pray. Uh, <laughs> there was a season in my life where that was a real thing. Like I, Really? Well, I was a new mom. And so I was falling asleep all the time. And I started to feel really guilty about that. And then I finally just felt like the Lord was like, Paige, stop it. That is a lie from the enemy. I love it when you come to me. And sometimes if you fall asleep, it is okay. You need to sleep, you know? Um, so I think there's barriers. I think too, what we were just talking about, the whole barrier of um, feeling like we can't be completely honest with God. And um, we try to make prayer just this really nice, neat formula. I think that there are some beautiful like principles about prayer that will take our prayer life to a new level. But sometimes I think we can so formulize prayer that it just becomes um, a task list rather than real communion with the Lord. So but there's so many. Well, I just feel like if you had not had that idea of prayer as a relationship with God that just kind of like an organic kind of permeates everything. Um, you might have looked at the situation with your daughter and the flower girl thing as, okay, she prayed, she got this answer, then it's over. But you know, when it became a little messy, you just kind of naturally went like answered that with more prayer and just more like, okay, God, you're still in this. Like, you know, even when you're kind of at your wits end, not knowing you're probably panicking that, that you're somehow your daughter's going to detract from this wedding ceremony. Um, and, and in desperation, like your response and your reflex was to go to God with more prayer. I love that. And I think it's so, so important to just, yeah, just always, always remember that pretty much the answer to everything is to pray about it. It's so but, true. I mean, prayer yeah. is prayer is meant to just be this conversation, mm -hmm. this ongoing conversation with the Lord. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think too often we compartmentalize the Lord. We compartmentalize our lives into this is sacred and this is secular. And yeah. when God wants to be a part of all of it, like he cares about every aspect of your life and, I think he just loves it when we invite him into the conversations that we're having. And so if we're at work having, you know, a, a dilemma, I mean, just quietly saying, Holy Spirit, help me. Can you give me insight? Uh, I can't tell you how many times I am talking to women who are pouring out their heart. And I don't know if a lot of pastors will say this, but sometimes women are pouring out their heart. And I am literally like, I have no idea what to say. I, I do not have a good answer here. I, so the whole time they're praying, I am doing my best to really listen, but I am simultaneously just like, Jesus, you've got to help me Jesus right now. Like, you know, and, um, he wants to be a part of that. And, and not just with, you know, in church situations, but also with my daughters, they yeah. get in the car after a hard day at school. And the other day, uh, one of them burst out into tears over a situation and we're driving and I'm listening, but I'm simultaneously like, yeah, Lord, I thank you. You're with me right here in this car. Help me. Give me your wisdom. Give me your guidance. And he will, 
You really will. Um, but yeah, just inviting them into all the, all the areas. So for the person listening, that's hearing some of you, like snippets of your prayer life and your husband's prayer life. Um, but it's just like, what you heard from God, like, what does that mean? Um, could you sort of talk about the process or the steps that, that might lead to, I don't know, maybe taking the first step to hearing from God for someone who's either new to prayer or has never had an experience of hearing back from God. I, mean, I was talking to my daughter the other day and she was just like, well, God's not going to answer back. Right. And I'm like, well, he is, but, but that's a weird concept for someone. So can you explain yeah. that a little bit just in more detail? Absolutely. Yeah. It, it can be very strange at first. Like, wait, what do you mean? But I think it's only strange because sometimes we have created this image that it is this like, they'll say, you know, like, like we're supposed to hear this, you know, the say of the Lord on tape, you know, they're booming like, voice. God, Yes, exactly. Or he's going to write on a wall or, you know, I remember, I remember in college, I, this is not in the book, but, um, I was trying to make sure I was hearing the Lord right about whether or not to marry my husband. And I was like, okay, God, or maybe this isn't the book. I don't know. Like if it's a yes, like just blow the tree this way. <laughs> like, you know, I think sometimes we just make it so complicated. We do. We look, you know, desperate yeah. to hear from him sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, just show me like neon sign, anything. I know. I know. And so I think what I usually try to encourage people is first of all, just, just to demystify a little bit. Like I think God is, he, he wants to talk to you. He probably already is talking to you. It's just learning to train yourself to recognize his voice. You know, there's a scripture in the Bible where Elijah talks about that, you know, God wasn't in the fire or the earthquake, but he was in the gentle whisper. And so I think I said this earlier, I think it was in the story about Selah, that I had the thought cross my mind, remind her of who she is. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the primary way that God speaks to me as I will have a thought and it. And so immediately, I know if, if that's not familiar, you're like, well, wait, maybe that was my thought. Maybe that's the enemy's thought. We can really begin to just kind of go in circles. But so, but what I usually like to say is, is if it's a thought that, um, that a it's, does it, is it a good thought? You know, that's a big one. Um, does it line up with scripture? Um, and, and then B like, it's, it's, it's not going to do any harm, you know, really, um, then, then that's something just at least act on it. And then I think what we begin to discover is as we act on the, that voice of God that we're hearing, it builds our confidence to know oh, that really was God. Like I can look back at that story and now I'm aware, like, cause really just reminding her of who she was should not have fully had the power that it had to, to change the outcome. But yeah, because those of us that have you know, young children or have had them in the, in the past realize that there are some times that you can't get them out of a tantrum. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or, like, I mean, that's, you know, even I could have had a moment where I'd argued and was like, that's not going to work God. <laughs> and I have had moments like that of like, mm -hmm. that's, that wasn't even the Lord. That was a stupid idea I had. But as you begin, what is it going to, what was it going to hurt? to try it right then, you know, nothing. And, and so then that just builds my confidence. Okay. So that, that was, that was the Lord. I say too, sometimes I feel like when God speaks, whether it's this, as I'm, for me, again, it's a thought that comes to mind. Sometimes it's just like an impression, like a, a leaning it has like a weight to it. And I don't know how to explain that any more than just to say, it's just, just feels a little bit different. Um, but I just would just encourage people a to to demystify it. It's it's not it's not weird or kooky. It's it's really pretty simple. And then B, just slowly start like trying to follow that voice. And I think because there have been a couple times I've tried something. I'm like, I don't think that was the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> but but then you begin to recognize the difference. Yeah, and I think sometimes we're afraid that we're gonna get it wrong or. Mm -hmm. But I mean, nobody, nobody has a hundred percent track record hearing from yeah. God. And I think if you give yourself that freedom 
to know that it's okay. And just, I mean, mm-hmm. now if you think God is calling you to sell everything you have and move somewhere else, I would give that a little bit more thought, a little bit more looking for confirmation, looking when the consequences and the stakes are high, absolutely don't just go on a whim. But for these other things, these faith building steps that are smaller steps that are kind of training yourself to to know what his voice sounds like, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to hear wrong, you know? And and I think there's freedom in that because then it makes it not about us. It makes mm-hmm. it about God and who he is. And and we're just kind of trying to trying to like I like the way you put that, training our ears to like yes. hear, hear his voice. I love that. I actually, I have, I have given like an assignment before to some, some girls I was discipling of, okay, this week I want you to get quiet and I want you to ask the Lord if he would give you like an encouraging thought or word or scripture for someone. That's a really safe way to practice that, you know, Mm -hmm. of like, you know, here's, and, and usually it's like a little scripture or a little like, you know, but it's actively like, Lord, I want to hear you. And then it's such a safe way of, because what I think usually happens is that person, when you share it with them, they're like, Oh, I, I so needed that this week. And if they don't give you that response, giving someone a verse of scripture, it, that isn't, that is an okay mistake to make, you know, like that's, that's not going to hurt anything, but, um, even just trying to, you know, like that's, that's the way you begin to train your ear. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And then when you do get those times where it's like, oh my gosh, you have no idea. I yeah. needed to hear this. I was asking God about something and this answers my question. And it's like, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. God used me. Like I heard mm-hmm. from him. Wow. I mean, then, then you get that experience and that, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's a very good idea. Yeah. Well, we're kind of running out of time here. I knew I would not get to everything, but one thing I want to get to is, oh my gosh, I got completely blown away from chapter 13. And I, because I was listening, I had to rewind it so I could get all the words, but this is, this is what you say. You're talking about kind of this concept of holding the mystery of God and how that's so hard for us as Christians. Sometimes this balance between on one hand, God isn't going to promise ease. He's not promising that we get everything that we want. But on the other hand, he's capable of doing anything. So in prayer, I love this quote. This is so good. So this is directly from the book. We watch people swing to the extremes, naming and claiming every blessing at every turn, or we find others embracing a sort of hopeless existence, encouraging others to just embrace the pain and join the club of disappointed Christians who've decided this lackluster life must be enough. This is so good. I Can you talk about that? And where do we fit on the spectrum and Uh how do we know, how do we know what to do? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that resonated. I actually remember writing that (laughs) or writing that sentence and, um, Oh yes, because I, I have experienced and some people like have, have been on both sides of the spectrum. You know what I mean? Like the same Mm -hmm. person, like, you know, in one year they're just, I am blessed and highly favored and here's all the things and God's going to do all the things. And, and then usually when they don't get everything they want or some sort of trial or hardship comes along, Mm -hmm. um, they go to the other side. And here's the thing, the way our world is too, right now, you can find someone on social media or YouTube proclaiming both sides in a way that is, is fairly, um, can convince you of it. You know what? I don't know if that makes sense. And so, um, you know, I feel like there's a big movement too right now of like, well, just it is what it is, you know, life is hard. And so just embrace the pain. And, and here's the thing, life is hard sometimes, you know? Yeah, it is. But I think where we we in the middle is God is good. Do you believe that God is good? And, but then here's the thing, you don't get to define what, what that looks like, you know, Mm -hmm. I think that's where, where we get into so much trouble is, um, as we try to tell God what good looks like now, just like my story with Selah, like he really can do those kinds of things, but sometimes, sometimes he doesn't, sometimes he does not answer our prayers. But if I believe that God is good and that God loves me and that God sees me, then 
then I am going to have the security and the hope that he must see something that I don't see. And therefore there's, there's purpose and reason. And basically him saying no to this thing I've been praying for. Now, does that mean you stop praying for everything? No. Cause I think there's a lot of Christians who've just stopped. Like, I'm just not even going to try. Yeah. I actually, last night I mentioned that community group. I had uh, one uh, young man said he has a seven-year-old right now. And he said the, she has started saying, mm-hmm. Hey dad, can I, and then she'll stop and say, "Never mind. You're going to say no. Mm-hmm. And he said, as a dad, I'm just like, no, wait, what were you going to ask me? Yes. I've had that. Yeah. I had that experience just yesterday with my daughter where she did the same exact thing. And I'm like, what? You're not going to even ask. Mm-hmm. And I think like, that's such a picture of, of how we become. Like if we get disappointed enough, we begin to assume that we know how God's going to respond. And and that's what his daughter's doing. Like, I already, I already know how you're going to respond. So I'm just, I'm just not going to ask, but, but she doesn't actually know fully like, and he wants to hear what she wants. The answer could be no, but the answer might just be later because what you want, I know that would be great for you in about three years when you're mature enough to be able to actually receive it. And, you know, and so in the moment, it feels like a no, when in reality, he's so delighted. She just voiced it to him. And I think so the heavenly father is with us as well. And so um, I, I don't have like a, I don't know if I'm giving you a great answer here. I don't, I don't know. Um, I have not actually, I need to think through where, where is that? Ten- I think it's just holding that attention and knowing um, that we're not going to understand everything that God is doing. But if we can stand on the belief that he is good and we can trust that, then I think we won't find ourselves constantly on this emotional, you know, pendulum swing going back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. Well, and I think in your answer, you totally address it's it's not about us. It's about God. And when we make it about us, we get blown and tossed by the wind on the pendulum of disappointment and elation and then if we make it about God and accepting that everything that he does for us is good. I just, I love that picture that you just gave us because having just been through that with my daughter where she said, you know, mom, can I, no, no, you're going to say no. Mm. The feeling in my heart is I want to bless you so much. Tell me, tell me so Mm -hmm. I can let you know if that's part of the big picture. Yes. For you, because I want to give you everything that your heart desires that is good for you. And if it's not good for you or not possible, you know, obviously the answer is going to have to be no or later, but what a beautiful picture of God. Like for me to be able to know that feeling that I have toward her, like I'm getting kind of emotional, just thinking that God thinks that about me, you know, if God feels that way and he just, he wants so badly to bless me. Wow. Like that's, powerful. That is so powerful. So thank you for that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, we are, we're out of time. I mean, this just flew by, but, um, I would love for you to let us know where we can find you online and on social media, where our listeners can find out more about your book and your ministry and everything, all the things. Okay. Well, my website is pageallen.net. So, and then, um, I'm on all the socials, um, page Allen, and then the whole word, Texas. So page Allen, Texas. So that's where you can find me. All right. And the page Allen, Texas, that's your, um, social media. That's my Instagram and Facebook. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's awesome. Well, we will post all of that information and, um, yeah, connect people up with you. How can we pray for you today? Oh, well, you can, let me see here. You can pray for me today. Um, I would actually love for y'all to pray, um, for it's not for me really, but, um, a woman that works with me and is really close to me, her 12 year old son, uh, was recently diagnosed with stage four lymphoma and I just love them. And I'm just really asking Jesus to heal him. And so his name is Dax. So if you guys would pray for Dax today, I'm just, I'm just really asking the Lord just to bring healing to him. So, yeah. Absolutely. 
Mm -hmm. Well, Paige, thank you for being here. Thank you for this beautiful book and just putting your heart into it and, and getting it out into the world. I know a lot of people are going to find a lot of hope and just healing, I think, from pain um, and, and just kind of a renewed outlook on who God is and who they are in God's eyes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time to talk about this book, to just talk about um, who you are and and who we are because of you, because of Jesus. God, we just pray that you would go before us and just help us to encounter you in new ways every, every step of our lives. Um, I just pray for anyone listening now who feels unseen, who feels unloved, who feels unnamed. God, that you would meet her right where she is right now, that you would surround her with your Holy Spirit like a blanket. You would just wrap her up and just let her feel a tangible presence. Mm -hmm. I just ask that you would help her to just remove any, any lies that she's imposed on herself or that the enemy is imposing on her about who you are and her ability to approach you. I just pray that you would remove any barriers from her meeting you face to face right now today in Jesus name. Lord, we lift up Paige and her family and just pray your blessing on them. We just pray for her ministry, for her writing, for all the things that she's doing that you would just help her to just stay firmly in your hand and, and see clearly next steps that she would just be able to hear your voice above all of the others to know um, what, what her next steps are. We just pray that you would, um, give her wisdom as she ministers to people in person and through her writing and in her family and just allow her to, to have the words and have the concepts and have the, um, just the things to say and, and to impart, um, to the people that are depending on her and that come to her and, and that you would help her to see the fruit of, um, the things that she's doing, Lord, that the things, all of the different directions that she's feeling pulled in, God, um, that, that there would just be evidence of fruit in all of those areas and that there would be no either or, that she would feel equipped for every single hat she has to wear and that she would feel just um, that the, each thing that she does, each area of her life would just be life-giving to her, God, and not draining because you are the source of living water that never runs dry. I just pray you would fill her to overflowing, to equip her for all of those things. And God, we pray for Dax. We know that you know exactly what he needs to bring healing to his body, whether that's a supernatural healing, whether that's a medication, a chemo, uh, whatever it is that, that needs to be done. We pray in Jesus' name that you would bring total, complete healing for the rest of his life from this disease. God, we just thank you that you love him more than even his parents could possibly love him. And, and we just pray, God, that you would hold him in your hand that you would walk beside him. I just pray against any fear or anxiety and that he would know that you are with him, that you would surround him by strong, loving people that will give him that support when he needs it. And I just pray that this experience would be used with the enemy intends for evil, that you would bring about good, that people would turn to you, that people would see your power and your goodness, that his parents, that he would see your provision in every single step of the way, that the outside looking in, people would see their faith, their um, reliance on you, and that it would make a difference, that it would make an impact, God, and that you would be glorified in this, and that he would come onto the other side of this with a faith that, that will never be taken away from him. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.